Don't Diss My Ability is made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store, helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations. Providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center, offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuro-emotional techniques, and massage therapy. And by One Sky Community Services. For over 30 years, One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Dedicated to every individual it serves, giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community. Serving 24 Seacoast communities, call 603-436-6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects, New England Design Redefined. See me beautiful, look for the best in me. It's what I really am and all I want to be. It may take some time, it may be hard to find, but see me beautiful. Hello, my name is Dr. David Rutstein. I'm delighted to uh, be here to talk about the wonderful new television show, Don't Diss My Ability. You know, that show um, speaks very credibly to the real-life situations that face uh, people with disabilities and um, uh, really tries to encourage the audience to understand what disabilities are about and how people can lead normal and productive and vibrant lives. As a public health expert, you know, I used to be the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, I understand the value of ensuring people remain healthy and vital uh, to um, what they do and the families they serve and the communities in which they live. Don't Diss My Ability uh, speaks very directly to this and I'm delighted that this television show uh, is gaining in popularity, having a wider and wider audience, and uh, is helping people throughout the seacoast and perhaps the nation to um, better understand what it means to live with disabilities. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Don't Diss My Ability. We're back again. Uh, I'm Ronnie Tomenio. Uh, on my left is, what is this pretty lady's name? <laughs> Pamela Sollenberger. Hello. And Mr. Lee Harvey. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good friends all. And we are joined today um, by a really longtime friend who means a lot to me, Mike Rogers. Uh, very talented man. Aren't you, Michael? You can say it. <laughs> it's okay to say it. <laughs> Why not? A legend in my own mind. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, we need to show today, I mean, not that Mike's, Mike certainly has serious issues that confronted him in his life, but um, sometimes what we do here uh, really grabs in your insides and tugs you because of the serious nature of uh, some of the guests and what they go through. 
Um, so, and it takes a lot out of you. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we're going to hear Mike sing and tell stories, and I'm going to read one, some poetry of his. And although the the nature of the show, even this show, is serious, uh, it it feels more calming to me. And uh, if that if that makes sense to you. Um, but I go back a long way with, with Mike. I don't remember when I met you, Mike. It's got to be maybe 30 years or 40 years oh, ago. Yeah, back in the 80s sometime. Yeah, yeah. And I've always been a fan of his music. Uh, but I'm a bigger fan of him as a human being. Uh, he's a very kind person. And to uh, give you an example, I, uh, <clears throat> I had a difficult year uh, with some surgeries. and. Uh, and I think when I uh, st was in recuperation there, uh, Mike started sending me a poem a day. And uh, mm. every day I'd wake up and I'd go to the computer and, uh, and, and there'd be a poem from Mike there. And, uh, and he's a wonderful poet. Not, not, not surprising, but he's a great songwriter and I think they go hand in hand. So every day um, I would wake up and there'd be a poem on my computer. And, uh, I think I was a, I think I was totally recovered, but I don't think I told Mike because I didn't want him to stop sending me poems. <laughs> you know, I, I could have milked that for another couple of weeks, Mike. And yeah, yeah. So um, we're going to start out with Mike doing a song, but I'm going to. I, I love when Mike does this. He. It's a it's a sequence where sometimes he'll he'll have an old story from his life. He'll turn it into a poem, and then he'll turn that into a song. So you, and, and it has real life to it. It's not just a, a song without any context to it. Uh, and that's what I love about what he does. So I'm going to read uh, the poem that this song is based on first. And then Mike's going to tell you the story behind it and the song behind it. Uh, just just to give you an idea of what Mike does, and then we're going to talk about his, his history and everything. I also should mention that we're one shy today. Uh, John Levering, our longtime uh, friend and co-host from when we used to do the radio show, has got a little illness today, so he won't be joining us. So Anyway, let me take a swig of water here, and I'll read Mike's poem. And by the way, we're real live human beings. We sneeze, sometimes we <laughs> fall out of our chairs. We do everything. So, and this is live TV, so don't even worry about it. We'll pick ourselves up, you know. We're trained to pick each other up. No problem. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called Otto. Nobody knew where Otto lived. His family, his job, his dreams. Frightened child in a man's body. His gaze never strayed from the space just above the handlebars of his bicycle. Feet encased in brown scuffed wingtips, perpetually pedaled. Sometimes prone in tall grass at the side of the road, he would stare across the gully. Green pants, green shirt, the Texaco man, camouflage in the weeds, riding point for some invisible platoon. Two eyes widened by life's surprises, watched unblinking from the middle of a wrinkled infant face, a tableau known to him alone. Otto rides down every street, ancient bike clattering over bumps and potholes. He sits on deserted bus stop benches, peeks through sun-dried blades in vacant lots and roadside fields. Everyone has seen him seen right through him, looked away. Okay, you got me on that one, Mike. That's a good one. <laughs> it's up well, to you, buddy. When I, was, uh, when I was a child, Otto actually, and I don't know what his name was, everybody called him Otto. Um, he was in our town, and you'd see him riding that bicycle. And I really wrote the poem not, so, not as much about Otto, but as the way sometimes society looks at, at the autos and uh, people with disabilities. Uh, you know, when I was a, a kid, I remember we had a blind man that used to walk up the street and he had a seeing eye dog. And when I would see him, 
it made me a little afraid, and I think it's because I didn't want to turn out like that. But I did anyway. So, um, and you know, there's, you find an auto in just about every city and town, wherever you go, somebody that's a little bit different, and people tend to look. They don't. They don't uh, see the real person. They they form their own opinions, or they look away because they don't want to. They don't want to turn out like that. They don't want to have that happen to them or somebody in their family. But uh, inside Otto, he's a real person. He has feelings just like the rest of us. You know, we all have those inner emotions. So inside, we're all the same. We may look different outside and even act different, but inside we have a lot that's, that's the same. And I changed it to, uh, I changed his name to Milo in the song because it flows better than Otto. So. <laughs> This is a song that came out of the poem, and it's just called Milo. Ain't nobody ever know his name, know his family, or where he came from. Scuffed up old wingtips, spinning round, round and round. They call him Milo. Lying in the grass by the side of the road, Milo's riding point to some special patrol. Some secret patrol Young child looking through an old man's eyes Milo's just waiting for life's next surprise They call him Milo Just Milo Crazy Milo Milo rides across this land, rides in every city, every little town. Sitting at the bus stop, peeking through the weeds, we look, you know, and we look away, but we don't see, we don't see Milo, crazy Milo. somebody who's got a problem. Yeah. yeah. Just just not seeing him as a human being sometimes, huh? That's right. You know, and 
sometimes it's, uh, I think it's fear, you know. Uh, prejudice is really, comes out of fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And when we don't understand something, well, we can be afraid of it and that can lead to this kind of behavior towards somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were saying that story, I was uh, remembering, uh, you said every town maybe has somebody like that. Mm -hmm. I, I remember one when I was a kid. Um, I don't want to take the time to go into it, but I, it is real. It's like, and, and as a kid, geez, I, I, don't, I don't know when the sensitivity gene kicks in as a child, but oh my. I mean, when you, <clears throat> the things you used to think and say when you were, 11 year old, 12 year old, uh, and you're grown up and you look back on it and say, did I really think that about somebody or mm. say that? And right. You regret it, but yeah. Better late than never though. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. So I wanna, I wanna do a little of your history about, because you weren't, you weren't born sightless. No. And let's take us to that. All right, I am, um, I was born in 1940. Uh, I'm 76 now. When I was young, I had sight. I started wearing glasses when I was about five. I, I was, they just classified me as nearsighted. And um, it stayed pretty much like that right through school. And as I got to be a young adult, um, you know, I, I drove a car. I had a license, had cars. <clears throat> and as a, as a young adult, I started to um, not see well at night and uh, I couldn't react fast. I could get around at night walking and that, but driving a car was another thing. So I gave up, uh, I gave up driving at night. When did you start to get a little bit hmm. fearful or scared, Mike? Um, I don't think I actually got really scared until I was maybe in my 30s. Hmm. You know, because before I just, I mean, I, I couldn't uh, see well at night, but I could do everything else. You know, it didn't affect my life other than I just didn't get in the car and drive at night. Um, but then slowly as time progressed, you know, I went to college, I got a degree, I became a teacher. I taught up in uh, Limerick, Maine for a few years. Then I came down to Kittery, Maine and uh, taught there and I was a re remedial reading teacher. And then I started to get, it, it bothered me to drive to school in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And so I gave that up. I was getting tunnel vision was developing because I have retinitis pigmentosa, which is a genetic... When did you first disease. find out that you had this? Uh, when I, it was probably in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So you knew that it was going to be progressive? And but I did, they didn't know anything then. about it. At that time, okay. nobody could tell me. They said, well, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. you're probably your sight will get worse as you get older. Mm -hmm. But... Um, maybe part denial, part just wanted to live my life. I just continued and um, as I said, I became a re remedial reading teacher. And then in my 30s, um, when I, after I had to give up driving, I rode a bicycle to work for a long time and then I walked to work. And eventually it got so that um, I was having trouble reading. I, was, uh, I had to shut one eye because it was, it was pretty much gone. And um, then I got nervous, you know, because mm -hmm. what am I going to do? Where, where are you? When did you meet your wife, Beverly? When, well, were we you met married in college. So we yeah. met in college. We got married in 1963, right after I graduated, mm -hmm. and uh, we moved up to Limerick, bought a little house there. So we've been married for 53 years now. We just wow. celebrated 53 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. and uh, she has been my eyes. She's been everything for me. She's. Oh. She's truly the better half, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got to the point in 1977 where things were really tough to get around and I went to my principal and told him I was going to have to uh, put in for early retirement and I did and, and I left my job in 1978. But I had met, uh, I, I started playing the harmonica at the age of 15 just for fun. My folks gave it gave me one for Christmas as a joke, and the joke was on them for a long time. I sounded so bad in the house, but uh, I de developed that, and I always played for my own amazement for years. And then um, I met uh, John Perot, who's uh, 
a songwriter, singer-songwriter, poet from here in the Portsmouth area. Mm. We were teaching together and we did a concert together and from there um, he asked me to join him and, and we started uh, working his music and, and going out and performing in public. Mm. So that took a lot of the pressure off you know, that I thought, well, I do have something, and once I... Was John the, one of the first, I know you, you, we're going to get into all of the different uh, permutations of your pairings with other artists, but uh, uh, was he the first person that you kind of like partnered with, John? Yes, he was the, mm -hmm. I didn't play any, uh, I, I hadn't done concerts or anything mm -hmm. until I met John, and we, we uh, did one, we were both teaching at Trape, we did a concert there, and then we did another one, and then we started working together with building his music and so he was really he taught me how to sing harmony um, you know and and by playing his music original music I was de able to develop my own style of harmonica playing so I owe a big debt to John Perot. Yeah mm -hmm. that, that's that's really special to, I, I've <laughs> seen you two together that is really special if you ever get a chance to do that John, if, uh, John Perrault, that you might not know, was a poet laureate of uh, Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, a few years back. Well-deserved honor. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't say that your, your poem, Otto, uh, tell us about your poem, Otto. That got some recognition, too. Well, I entered it in the, um, back, I think it was around 99 or 2000, I entered it in the New England Writers Competition, uh, Poetry comp Competition, and uh, kind of forgot about it and went up, we went up to the finals and I, I was one of the finalists. Mm. And um, so that was kind of an honor. It got published oh, yeah. in the New England Writers' Almanac. Well, that's nice. quite something. Nice. Yeah. So let's get back to your story though. So how did Bev react to this? What did, what was, I mean, it's, a, it's wonderful that you had her by your side. I, I can't imagine going through that all by yourself. Mm. You know? No, she was always supportive, <coughs> you know. Yeah. Um, she took over all the driving and uh, uh, when I got into music, she was supported me all the way, often coming on jobs for a while. She, for quite a while, she ran sound equipment for around the, you know, ran, ran the soundboard for John and I. And, um, so, and eventually, uh, she just naturally became part of the music, and we have been performing together uh, since 1984. In Salt yeah. River, you mean? Uh, so, no, actually, Bev and I. Oh, you, you two? Yeah, she started. I don't think I've ever heard just you two we, um, together. We yes, both became many of the Baha'i Faith, and this fellow, Dick Grover, who uh, sang, he and I would go out and, and sing together at functions, and he said to Bev, you know, one time she was kind of singing along with us at the house, and he said, you got to learn to sing. <laughs> you have to get out there and sing with Mike. So she did, and we've been singing together ever since. I didn't know you were so receptive. Bev's over there, you can't see her. Bev, I didn't know you were so receptive to suggestions. I really <laughs> like lemon pie, Bev. <laughs> Meringue is not good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so, she, I, 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 yeah, I don't, that's a, I've seen you in a lot of different, uh, as I say, pairings with other people, but I've never, I don't think I've seen you and Bev together. Well, when we went, uh, uh, for the Baha'i Faith, we went down to uh, San Salvador Island and we lived there for three and a half years and it was just the two of us. And so we would sing at a lot of functions at different churches down there. And uh, it was a little tiny island, about 500 people, way, way out in the middle of the ocean. And um, they would have things, they would have these sings at church and we would go and and sing together, and then we would travel to other islands and sing. And uh, then I developed uh, this workshop, harmonica workshop, with these kids out there. Uh, we taught a little, a bunch of young girls and boys to play the harmonica, and uh, she joined me on that. And we came back. We developed our harmonica workshop program, which she assists in. And, and she and I did a lot of concerts for school children all around the South. Um, we were members of the very special arts program in Georgia, and they would send us to all kinds of cities and towns around Georgia, and we would perform and um, play the harmonica. And it was kind of like, it was very special arts was set up to bring artists in, uh, to, to align them with um, children with disabilities and to bring 
uh, how did the children, artists with disabilities into the mainstream. So how did the children react to you knowing that you were blind? Oh, they were always very interested. They had lots of questions. What would they ask you? Do you remember? Just, uh, well, you know, how long have you played the harmonica? How did you learn? To, how can you play the guitar when you're blind? How do you put your pants on? <laughs> <laughs> really? They ask you oh, yeah, they, they ask you. <laughs> my oh, wife yeah. asked me how I put my pants on. I said, it's none of your business. <laughs> I mean, I don't ask you how you do your thing. <laughs> yeah, so they really asked you that. Oh, yeah, we had, we had a great time with kids. We would go in uh, for a while when we were up here. Bev and I used to go down to Pennsylvania and do all the Hershey school fourth grade oh. in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah. They'd send us down there for a week. And um, we go in and do like maybe 15, 20 different groups of kids. That, that's got to be a, really a riot. Yeah. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Fourth <laughs> graders are a lot of fun. You know, they, they haven't reached that really obnoxious stage yet. Right. <laughs> Family Lee, got any questions? Um, now I have a CD in my apartment of you and your wife. That's why I know oh. they've, oh. they've performed uh -huh. together. Yes, we do have a CD. That's, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. We did that about two years ago, I think, and uh, it, it's songs that have to do with principles of the Baha'i faith, uh, mm. okay. you know, equality and, and world peace. You know, what I want you to do, because I really think it's timely, uh, Pamela's going to do her uh, grief segment at four, but after that, I, 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 think, I think right now the atmosphere in the country needs your song mm. uh, variety. Mm. Well, that was one of the ones I'd planned to bring. Um, oh, good. So after she does it, uh, we're about uh, five minutes to four, Mike, and then after she does mm -hmm. the grief segment, then I'll oh, ask right, you to sure. do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. all right. So, so you got scared when you were losing your eyes, and but when mm -hmm. did you know that this was going to be? This was not reversible. This was going to mm -hmm. be your future. And, I think uh, probably in the mid-70s, in my mm -hmm. mid-30s, I realized that Aww. something was going to happen. And I, yeah. You know, after spending all those years in college and, and working in schools uh, in reading, you know, I taught remedial reading, so yeah. it, was, um, it was pretty hard on me for a while. And uh, mm -hmm. when I had to leave my job, I really did a job on myself with self-pity for two or three years until I pulled myself out of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How bad did it get? Well, I, I r depended on um, chemical, <laughs> <laughs> chemical uh, peace of mind. Mm -hmm. and, um, so you drank Mountain Dew? Uh, <laughs> sort of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I finally, uh, you know, I, I came to my senses yeah. and um, with some help from support groups, I. Good. I got my sobriety back, and mm -hmm. and uh, life. Once I did that, mm -hmm. life just it started. I started living life on life's terms, and that really mm. changed me a lot wow. for the better. Wow. When, uh, were you going to say something? Um, I have a, do have a question. I guess for me, living with a disability, how do you see yourself now versus how you saw yourself before you were where you were going blind? Before I was going blind? Yeah, and how do you see the world? Um, I actually see myself in a better light. I think uh, for years I was uh, dealing, you know, trying, trying to be something that I wasn't as I was losing my sight. Not, you know, I was in denial. And um, I, I think I was afraid of, of trying things, you know. I didn't have the nerve to go try something different. I was kind of trapped in my own insecurity. But after I um, got through, you know, made it through, I suddenly saw life as just, you know, it's like this is the way it is and this is my reality and it's up to me to deal with it. It's mm -hmm. up to me to make the changes. They have to come within me. And since I did that, I lost my fear. Mm -hmm. I lost fear of life. I don't have that today. Mm -hmm. I haven't had it for a long time. And it's a wonderful feeling not to be afraid of life. So that's a gift, really. Yeah, that's I mean, beautiful. And now you've brought it on yourself, but beautiful. after, as a result of yeah. what you've had to yeah, deal a, with. Yeah, you know, I, I believe in a higher power, and I think that had a lot to do with mm -hmm. my changes, too, you know. I, I think this is really important. It's, I mean, 
It's one thing for somebody uh, who's got, you know, is young and healthy and doesn't have a thing wrong with them to say, you know, no reason to be afraid. Hmm. Uh, you'll be okay. But, but it really means more. And I'm not just singling you out, Mike. The people we see on the show, to come on a show, which is kind of for some people nervous, it creates nerves, to be on a show and, and put your story out to the public. So we're seeing the people who haven't given up. The ones who, who haven't been incapacitated by, by, by fear. And, that, and that's, this is the biggest reason for this show. I mean, you're home and you got your problems, but, you're, but this is a pretty serious uh, obstacle in your path. Yeah. I mean, don't go by me. I am not an example. I, I, I have this old man's phone. You probably, you, we're on Facebook together. You read this, right, Mike? <laughs> and I, I've had this, I should have gotten rid of it years ago, but I don't like to get rid of everything, I, anything, you know? Uh, my wife wants me to get new shoes. No, I don't need new shoes. These are okay. Uh, so I don't know what I did with it. I was playing with the grandkids outside in the park, and I lost my phone. And I tell you, I had a terrible afternoon. You know, I said, where's my phone? I don't have my phone, you know, and... Look, I, I, is that something to get nuts about in the hindsight, you know, and I, and I was really kind of uh, embarrassed for myself that I didn't handle that, you know, and I, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's trivial, it's nothing. I, I broke down, I got a new phone, and it's better than ever, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm really almost embarrassed to, to say this, but if you're out there and you get worried because you can't find your phone or you you got mismatched socks on L listen to sh people that we mm -hmm. have on here and mike this okay. so when he says he's lost his fear you can do it too oh yeah that's right but, uh, i guess the part in listening to what mike said though he did struggle there for a while and and he that's did. part of life you know? right. right it that's is right. you know and that's right eventually it might take some time to pick yourself up, but if you keep right. trying, you eventually do it. Well, you're a great example, too. Yeah, exactly. What are you doing here? You're, you're, you haven't right. given what up. What am I here. doing? I have no... <laughs> <laughs> I asked that myself, but you haven't given up. I mean, right. you're not curled up in a ball in your room. Um, some days I am, but yeah. most it's, days I'm not. It's okay yeah. to grieve, you know. That's yeah. right. Everybody needs to have a grieving time for, That's right. for losses. But right. you can't get hung up in the grave. There, there reaches right. a point where you have to say, okay, yeah. where do we go now? That's, That's right. right. Great lead into to Pamela. That's right. Go ahead, That's Pamela. Right. Well, I'm just going to mention to Mike, you know, during that period, that whole loss of identity for you and the whole transition, you know, was, a, am sure, a time to have to move to, okay, what is important to me now? And like you said, that whole grieving process, we grieve through so much. And that whole transition, whether it's a change, whether it's transition, whether it's a disability that comes in, or a loss of a loved one, whatever it is. Or a loss of a phone. Or a loss of a phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I know you were grieving that day. <laughs> you could have called. I could have called. Look, uh, I, I have a friend who's a professional grief counselor. I didn't even think of it. Well, there Next you go. Next time I lose a phone or something like that, or I can't find a sock, I'm oh, calling you oh, up. Oh, yeah. Just ring me up. Right. Okay. <laughs> But in, in reference to how we transition through that, and Mike's a fabulous example, Lee's a fabulous example of that, you transition in, in the piece where you're saying, okay, what's important to me now? What can I do? What's, you know, when you look at what's in your heart of hearts and you go through all of that, you know, you change so much. You change in that moment. Mm -hmm. You're forever changed in that moment. And so you're not the person you were the minute before, you know? Uh, so we, we look at that, we move from that. Okay, how can we now? What do you mean when you say you're not the person you were a minute ago? You never were. You uh, can explain more. Okay. I get up every morning and ask myself that. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, Lee asked. Well, <laughs> because once you have a loss, you, you are not that person. That that's how you are forever changed. So if from you can the loss. from the loss. So if you can look at that change, when you get to the place like 
Mike was saying, and three years later he was able to say, okay, now it's time. It was time for him to move and, and develop the sense of purpose here in life. And to have no fear of life, how fabulous is that? Because there's so much that's fear-based in life, that's probably what you're doing yeah. as a counselor, trying to get to the pl get them to the place where Mike is at. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Yeah, where a lot of people can't, you know, because they'll grieve the rest of their lives and they can't move from it. You know, my uh, my life was always, you know, the glass was half empty mm -hmm. until I uh, made that transition. Isn't that now I, I see my glass is half full. You yeah. Know? How interesting, yeah. Hmm. That's, fa that's fabulous. Yeah. So, so, speaking of grief, I mean, uh, I'm not a, this is not a political show, I'm not getting into that. There's a lot of deep reasons why I don't like to get into politics, uh, other than the fact that I'm really tired of the last six months of turning on TV and hearing mm. political ads and then having to run into the shower, you know, constantly. Mm. I felt like I had fallen down into some water that uh, had been there for too long and stunk or something. Yeah. I just had to feel clean again. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so sensitive how we speak to each other, mm -hmm. working in the field of disabilities and knowing that one, un, one, one off word could really harm somebody. Mm -hmm. So to, so to experience this last uh, cycle uh, it's, it's been, you know, I could have done without it. But I do notice, and I'm not, you know, this is just one man's opinion, but I do notice tremendous grief over this. I, I got my coffee from Dunkin' Donuts this morning, and the guy's handing me the cup, and he's crying in my coffee. So that's, that's you know, yeah. I mean, I, typical. I'm, yeah, <laughs> he's crying. Okay, okay, you're upset over the election. You don't have to cry in my coffee, you know. I said cream, too sweet and low. I didn't say tears, <laughs> you know, but it's just, yeah. it's everywhere, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm just thinking of your song mm -hmm. that, and the message of your song that you're going to sing, Variety, is just more needed now than ever. Mm. This is the, the counter. The, the counterpoint to closed-mindedness is not screaming at them. It's, it's, a, it's a different message. And this is, listen to the message of this song that you wrote when? How many years did you Oh, I wrote it? this probably 30 years ago. Okay, but it's more timely now on this day than it's ever been. Go ahead, buddy. This song is a little hard for me to hear this because this was played at Keith Wilson's Celebration of oh, life. That's right. Do you yes. oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know oh. this. I don't know this. He liked this song. Yes, he did. Yeah. Who was oh. Keith Wilson? Keith Wilson was a member at Crumbs. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. Who died? Young man. He was a very young. I very do young. remember. Yeah. Him. Oh, absolutely. He was. He he was, was the Crumbs is the brain injury uh, uh, support uh, guy. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, center and in Portsmouth, where uh, Lee goes three times yeah. a week, and Mike played there. Yeah. So I didn't know that you played that for Keith. What a, yeah, a yeah. nice young fellow. Oh, he we was. used to go there and uh, perform for the group, and he would always come up and say how much you liked that song. And Variety? Yeah. Okay. Oh. So for Keith, too, and all oh. the people who need to hear <laughs> oh. this song. Well, this song is really about getting rid of all forms of prejudice. There's so many different kinds of prejudice. And, um, you know, I have read from learned people that uh, until we get rid of prejudice, we'll never have world peace. That's mm. the truth, you know. I mean, it's, yeah. It just does so much damage. So this is this is about getting along with people and learning to love people for their for all of our differences mm -hmm. and not looking at the differences as, as something that's uh, you know going to push us apart. And it's just called variety. <laughs> Would you like me if I came from Mexico? Would you like me if I came from Tokyo? Would you like me as a Scandinavian? Would you like me if I came from Michigan? Whoa, maybe so, we hope so. 
Would you like me if I cooked with a garlic spice? Would you like me if I lived on Persian rice? Would you like me if I ate from a wooden dish? Would you like me if I loved to eat raw fish? Sushi V-A-R-I-E-T-Y Spices up our day When we get together The world will be a better place for us to stay Would you like me in a suit of mm, Harris Tweed? Would you like me if my hat was made out of weeds? Would you like me in the robes of kings and queens? Would you like me in my faded old blue jeans? Gosh, gosh, my gosh, <laughs> Levi and you know who. Would you like me if my house was stone or wood? Would you like me if my house was ice or mud? Would you like me if my house was big or small? Would you like me if I had no house at all? Variety, B A R I E T Y, spices up our day. When we get together, the world will be a better place for us to stay. Would you like me if I prayed beneath a cross? Would you like me if I worshiped in a mosque? Would you like me if I wore a yarn? Would you like me if I said Allahu Akbar? God is most glorious. <coughs>
have a lot of the same issues as people with disabilities. You know, your hearing goes bad, your body kind of starts failing you, and you need some help, you know. It, uh, mm -hmm. You need, you kind of become what I call a high maintenance person, <laughs> and um, you need help, and the, those people are getting harder and harder to find. Mm -hmm. Those, you know, it's, there isn't really a whole lot of an unemployment now, so people that want a job can get a job. So we're having problems finding mm. people to but you, help our community. But you opened my eyes on the way over. You were talking about the fact that there's nobody there at night now and what that, what kind of emotions that generated. Talk uh, a little bit about that. I mean, well, it stresses people that know they might need help at night, you know, and there's might not be somebody that they know coming in. Yeah, the, they give you, what, the medical alert instead of a human being? Yeah, well, you'll get an EMT, and if you can communicate with him. And you worried about some of your friends there who, who have uh, disabilities that where they have a hard time even speaking. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's stressful to them, and I mm -hmm. care about these people. And, mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I don't like to see people stressed more than they're already stressed because of their disability. You know, it's just hurts me. When you were telling me that story, at first I, would, I, I didn't react to it, but then I was looking it through my eyes and, and you know, I, I, I don't have the degree of, uh, I, I, there's no comparison between me and you and, the, uh, and others who live there. The, the, the fact that the fear factor of, oh my God, if I get sick in the middle of the night, there's nobody here now. Right. And, and that runs through you where that I figured if I was sick in the middle of the night, I'd just uh, call my wife or, you know, make a telephone call or something if I was able to. Yeah, I mean, if you have family that you live with, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't, you're more on your own and you're mm -hmm. more counting on your hopefully good friends and people that know you and mm -hmm can explain to other people what some of your issues are. I mean, I have you know, a left side that doesn't work. And when people look at me who might not know me, they don't know why, you know. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, I had people last week coming out of the dentist ask me, do you have Parkinson's, which I don't. I've had a stroke. But I can present myself in a similar way. If I'm really tired, mm -hmm. yeah, you know. So people, yeah. it's my life is easier if I'm around people that know me and can help explain to people. This isn't easy what for I'm you. I, I remember we used to leave the radio show, and on the way out, you, anyway, thank you for doing that, Lee. And if you can, if you consider this field of employment, uh, Michael from harmonica, I can't, I can't live without your harmonica, but. <laughs> See me beautiful, look for the best in me It's what I really am, and all I want to be It may take some time, it may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful. Don't Diss My Ability has been made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations. Providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine Seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center, offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, 
holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuroemotional techniques, and massage therapy. And by One Sky Community Services. For over 30 years, One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Dedicated to every individual it serves, giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community. Serving 24 Seacoast communities, call 603-436-6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects. New England design redefined.